If you have your scriptures, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I am going to ask someone if they could be a servant for me to get me a hot glass of tea. If, if somebody could run and get that for me. <clears throat> I didn't preach last week, and so when I don't use my voice and I do preach, normally I end up straining it somewhat, and so I apologize for the roughness of my voice. But we've been doing uh, a series called Living Life from the Inside Out, and what we have shared is that the majority of people, even believers, are still attempting to live their life, resourcing their life from the outside in. And we started out in that scripture that is very well known, that it says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new crea creation. Old things pass away. Behold, the new has come. And really the tension in every believer's life is, is how much of the old we're letting go of so that the new can really come. And so many believers, I see, they live below the spiritual poverty line in that because they can't let go of the old, because it's all they've known, they still tangibly rely upon the earth to be the source of their resourcing. And so they live by what they see. They live by the emotional information they receive as other people emote towards them. And, and, and they just ride this emotional roller coaster on all of these inputs from the world. Even naturally, financially, you know, we're trying to make sure that we can make enough brick out of enough straw and mud to sur survive. And so our economy is not based on a kingdom economy. Our emotional life is not based upon God's delight for us and that, that heart connection, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. And so many of us, we, we just are registering the environment that surrounds us. But my challenge for us was, was this. I just emphatically stated, and it's a paraphrase of a number of, 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 of scriptures. It's not explicitly stated this way in the Bible, so I'm not quoting a verse, but we've heard this phrase before. We are in this world, but we are not of it. And those of us that have passed from death to life, and, and we have gone through the cross and experienced, you know, the death of the old, and then understand that we have been crucified with Christ, yet we live, but yet now the life that we're living, we're not living out of the resourcing of that old life, but now resurrection life has filled us. We become a new creation. We've been born from above, and so the, the statement that I made to us is there's a part of you now that did not exist before that exists now. And that spirit that has been uh, reborn within you, its origins is from heaven, and so now for it to breathe, for it to have expression of life, for it to have any type of resourcing you have to receive those resources. You have to have that life support, not from anything on the earth. There is nothing in this fallen planet that can offer life support to your spirit. If you're going to have spiritual life and have spiritual life dynamics on the inside, you're going to have to get that from where you came from now, and that is from heaven. So that life support system, you must derive your life, you must feed upon the life that is centered around heaven. And so we just said, God's purpose for us, you know, otherwise when we got born again, he would immediately taken us to heaven. But he caused us to be born again and he left us here. And so the purpose of him leaving us here was that we could have kingdom expression, that the life within us could now be made manifest. And one of my favorite passages of Scripture is, is in 1 John, where John said, hey, I want to have fellowship with you so you can have 
fellowship with the ones that I'm in fellowship with, and that's the Father and His Son. Because, listen, we've tasted of this life. We've touched this life. We've handled it. It's real. This is not a fairy tale. This is not something that is ethereal, that is untouchable and untangible. No, heaven is for real, if I can quote the movie title. And just so, because your physical eyes cannot see it and your natural ears cannot hear it, doesn't mean that it cannot be perceived, but it has to be perceived through a different set of faculties. And it says that eyes cannot see, ears cannot hear. The heart, in its limitations, cannot perceive what God has prepared for them that has loved him, but God has revealed them unto us, what God has prepared for us. He has revealed them to us by Holy Spirit revelation. And so it takes God to know God, it takes God to reveal God, but God is is desirous to unveil himself and to open to us, and we're going to get there in just a moment, talking about the windows of heaven. He wants us to be able to have an open windows experience where we're able to see beyond what we can see through the veil of our flesh and this veil of flesh and the natural. He wants us to see beyond it and to peer into eternity so that we can live with an eternal perspective, that we can live with an eternal reality and a grid that is rooted in the reality of heaven. Now, in this series, what we did was we talked, and I'm going to do this quickly, we went to a text out of Romans 14, 17. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to review quickly. But I'm going to remind you of a principle that I gave you when I, when I taught on this passage of Scripture. There have been many times where I've had family photo shoots, Christmas, we just got through Thanksgiving, there were family pictures that were taken, and as those... In the old days, as the film was developed, right? Remember those days? But now, as the digital imagery is downloaded and it's shared among the people that took the picture, you look at that, and what is the impulse and the tendency that we all have if you've been in a group photo and you look at the group photo? Yeah, there could be 15 family members in the picture, but your first impulse is to find yourself in the midst of your family. You're not wanting to see what grandma and grandpa looks like in the picture. You're not wanting to see what your wife or your children look like. Your first instinct and impulse in that group photo is to find yourself in there because you want to make sure your eyes were open and that they didn't catch you with some type of a weird look Uh, because you want to make sure that you look good in the family photo. And there's been some family photos that once they were sent to me, I text back to the person that sent that to me and said, please delete this photo. (laughs) I had one eye open, one eye closed. It looked like I was high on drugs. Please delete this immediately. (laughs) But I shared with you that principle. Sometimes when we study the scriptures, our first instinct and impulse is to try to personalize it where we think this text is only about me. And we said that in Romans 14, verse 17, it said the kingdom of God, everybody say the kingdom of God. And so we need to to emphasize, we we wanna state that it is a domain of the king but it is the king's domain, and the king of that domain is God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So my first impulse and instinct when I read that is how can my king, having this vast domain, how can I get this righteousness, peace, and joy? Because it's all about me. But really, when we do that, we miss out on the power of the truth that's in the passage. Because the revelation will ultimately have a cause and effect. The revelation will impact you. Yes, the joy of God, the peace of God, and the righteousness of God. 
Because if you're aligned with the king and his kingdom and you put the king in his rightful place, it will have profound transforming effect on your life. But the truth is we're not talking about our righteousness, our peace, or our joy, or our portion of that. It's talking about the righteousness of God, the peace of God, and the joy of the Lord. And I'm going to review very quickly what we meant by that, because these three truths and these three statements, as it were, they offer then great security, stability, and, and, and strength to me when I begin to, to allow the Holy Spirit to open up my heart and mind to comprehend what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when he said the kingdom of God is, is righteousness, what we're saying is that God is in his rightful place. He is the only one qualified to be God, and he is God all by himself. Therefore, because he's the only one that qualifies to be God, and God is in his rightful place, the one who has perfect integrity, perfect character, and, and, and has a perfect nature, he is the only one that can be that, so there is no one that can ever replace him. There is not a moment where God is going to make a mistake or mess up and say, I disqualified myself from this place. I need to step down from being God. We have security today in the sovereignty of God because God is in his rightful place. Then we said that God wants the fabric of the kingdom to impact our lives through the peace of God. And by that we said God knows how to effectively do his God job. Not only does he have the character to, to maintain that place, but he is effective in how he executes his plans and his purpose. Therefore we said he's not worried or stressed about any day at work that he shows up on the job. You do not wear the Lord out. He is not stressed of saying, oh my Lord, I got to deal with springs of life again today. <laughs> These people just wear me out and all their problems and all of the things they're going through and all the requests they're giving me. I just, I just don't want to show up for work today because of all the stuff they're praying and sending my way. God's not worried. He's not stressed. He doesn't fret or fearful about anything. Matter of fact, he sees that his plan is coming to pass according to his perfect timing based upon his pleasure of the dreams that he has dreamed about that purpose. And so from that, there is this stability. There's security, there is stability. But the final one is that God is not just effective in his job because he has power to accomplish whatever he wants to do. But there is an attitude in which he carries out his work. Now, there have been times where I, I've seen people that are very effective in what they do, but man, do they have a bad attitude as they do it. They're the best man for the job in that they know technically how to do it. They're an expert in their field, but man, they let you know that they don't enjoy doing what they're doing. God enjoys being God, and he enjoys implementing his plan and his purpose, so there is this delight and enjoyment. There is this satisfaction that he has in implementing what he does and his plan, and so the kingdom of God for us today is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I said Holy Ghost because I was raised a Pentecostal. I wanted to become, do a little King James with you this morning. And, and, and the way that I could restate that is that we have security as the people of God. We have stability as the people of God. And we have his joy strength that strengthens us as we're in this world, not of it. But we know that we are going to make it. Now, this is where I want to go today. We know that we're going to make it because he is making all of heaven available to us. Now let's read this text 
It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with, and can everybody say with me together, every spiritual blessing. With every spiritual blessing. Now, if we can try, and we need to ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit to help us stretch our mind around just that simple phrase, every blessing that God has dreamed of to resource, to enrich, and to be gracious to his people. Everything that God has said, this could be a blessing. God has made that blessing available to you and I in Christ Jesus. What is available to Christ is available to me. That's why it says we become heirs of God, but then when in, in our relationship with Christ, we become joint heirs with him. So everything that God dreamed of blessing Jesus with now is made available to me and to you, and I become full joint heir in what Jesus is receiving from the Father. Right now, Jesus is living life large. And, and when, I, I got to wait. I don't want to get a hold of myself or get ahead of myself. And I, I, I'm just going to back off because there's a, a truth thought that I want to throw out to you in a few minutes. But Jesus right now is living a life that all of you have dreamed about. Could it be possible that this type of life could be lived? Jesus is living that right now. And it's because the Father has blessed Jesus with every possible blessing in the heavenly realm. But this is the purpose for this series because I want to begin to drill down and explore how we can take that which is real in heaven, heavenly realities, eternal certainties, those things that are invisible to my natural eye, but yet they're very real. How do we take the unseen and make it seen? How do we take the invisible and make it visible? How do we see heaven and all of this blessing that is now resident in heaven? How can we see his kingdom come in the earth just like it is in heaven? Because what I see by observation in the church, is many times there is a disconnect from what is positionally ours in Christ and then what we're living out experientially. And so, is there something that we're missing? Is there a, something in the middle between what is positional and what is experiential that we're not getting? And what it does is it delays destiny. It causes us not to fully partake of what God has for us. Now, I want to say this right away. Before we probe and press into what it means to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ, I think that we have to understand proportionality. And by that, I mean we need to understand how vast, how large, how immeasurable these blessings are. You said, Lynn, that I get everything that Jesus has and whatever the Father has blessed him with, but what is that? How large of a blessing is that? How many blessings are there? Well, we know that it's every, but how, how, what is the dimensions of that? Well, there's a few passages of Scripture that just give us a glimpse of the proportion of the blessing that God wants to enrich our life with. Here is one in Ephesians chapter 3. That God can do, quote it with me if you know, can do the exceeding abundant above all that you could ask, and I like to throw this in, think or imagine. He said that he can do, he is able to do the exceeding abundant above all that we can think or imagine. With me, join with me. He is able to do exceeding, abundant, above all that you can think or imagine. 
That's why I say, Holy Spirit, if I try to measure it, if I try to fathom it, if I try to look at, at what this thing is and describe it, I will always measure far short of what the reality of the proportion of the blessing that is for you in the kingdom of God. I will always underestimate. I will always fall short in calculating and in doing addition of, of trying to measure it and add up to what it uh, quantitatively measures out to. God wants to do in your life exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all you could dream, think, or imagine. Here's another one. Jesus said, and, and this is this is an area of faith and obedience, and there's warfare involved in it. I get it. But G Jesus said, I'm talking about as you, the kingdom comes, as the will of God is done, and as the people of God obey in faith, even though they know in part and see in part, but as they obey in faith, Jesus said, give, and it shall be given to you. In other words, acts of faith in obedience release and unlock the treasury of heaven, and this is the result. He said this would be the result. If you want to try to quantify what the blessings look like, he said it would be given back to you, quote it with me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now normally, because I, I'm not a farmer that deals with seed and seed bags and trying to get the most seed into a bag, normally it's me taking out the garbage every week. Where this principle of, of pressing down, <laughs> shaking together, because we have a problem where our trash runs over. But when he said, press down, shaking together, it's, it's, it's that I want there to be more in what you're presenting to me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill it, but then I'm going to press it down. And then I'm going to shake it. And then it's going to come over the capacity that you have to receive. That is the dimensions of the blessing of God. Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to go there in a few minutes, but I'm just throwing out proportionality of the, of the blessings that God wants. When we feed from heaven, when we resource from heaven, there is nothing that, that it's going to be slightly above normal. I find nothing in the Word of God where the Bible says when we tap into kingdom dimensions and begin to partake of kingdom blessings that the result of the experience and life experience of you connecting with heaven in that way is you're going to look slightly above normal. No, it's always extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's something beyond the norm, something beyond the, the ordinary. And so the prophet Malachi said this. He said, as you present the Lord the tithe and bring it into the storehouse, that there may be food in his house, he said, I will open up the windows of heaven. And he said, I'm going to pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. And then my translation in the ASV, which I believe is up there, it said, there will be no need. Can you imagine your life in the future? And whenever I share this, I can tell people have become so resistant and inoculated to the truth of the gospel and we have lowered the bar of our expectation so low that when we teach the Bible, there is this thing where I feel like I have to emphasize it, but almost overemphasize it to encourage people to believe for a biblical kingdom standard for your life. And I want to tell you today, I'm not telling you that that. that this is what I think God says. I am quoting to you passages of Scripture. He said, I will pour you out blessings where there will be no need. The King James says, I will pour you out blessings so much that you cannot contain the blessings that I'm going to give you. So, I don't know about you. I have been a giver. 
I have tried to obey the Lord in faith and obedience. There have been many things where I've tried to say, okay, Lord, as I try to walk in the Spirit and I try to faithfully obey your word, why is it that sometimes the, the, the action does not lead to this type of biblical blessing, the above and beyond? Why is it that sometimes it's just a little bit? I get a little glimpse. Yes, I see it, but I thought there'd be a whole lot more. Why isn't it earth shaking, earth shattering? Why isn't it Red Sea opening up experiences? I want it, I want it to go a little, one of the Christian radio uh, stations, network of stations, they have this uh, motto, just a shade above normal. And I want to write to them and say, go back to the Bible. We're to be far above a shade above normal. We are, we are New Testament, covenant believing believers that we believe that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in him. So I have, to, I have to then change my perspective when it says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And I just say, well, they're going to stay there until I die, I guess. I'll get them when I get there. But Dallas Willard said this, and he wanted to provoke us in that statement. He said, he said the purpose of the born-again experience is not to get you to heaven when you die. It's so that you can experience heaven before you die. So, where is this link between these two things of the sowing that results in, in kingdom harvest? The sowing that can lead to kingdom reaping? Where is this link, this missing link between what we do in faith and then the results that God has promised for us? I want us to go to Malachi, and it's up. Uh, I need to get to Malachi. I was going to have us go to Colossians, but I think I'm going to press ahead and go right into Malachi. Now, whenever I teach as a pastor out of Malachi chapter 3, there is a knee-jerk reaction because you guys have heard messages out of Malachi 3 about tithing. How many have heard some messages on tithing? And after you got that message, you felt like you were thoroughly worked over by the pastor. Because <laughs> there was some shortfall in the budget, uh, and they were needing to emphasize giving to somehow activate people to give. Well, here's my confession. We don't have a deficit in the budget. I'm not asking for your money today. What I want to talk about is the missing link between your sowing and your reaping, because this is what I believe about the people in this church. I believe all of you that are born again, Jesus has given you a new heart. And I believe that you live to give. And because I know many of you personally, you in your life demonstrate that level of lifestyle. And sometimes you go, I wish I could give more money, but you're giving of yourself, you're giving of your time, you're giving of your giftings and your talents, and, and you're giving. And some of you, I just say, now remember, it is seed to sow and bread for food. Some of you are sowing the bread that God provided for you to eat. Yeah. Remember, some of that blessing that he gave you is for you to feed your family. Don't give it all away. You've got to discern what's bread for food and then the overflow, which is the seed to sow. But I want us to see something here that could be a very... I saw some women look at their husbands and, and vice versa. Oh, let's pray right now. Lord, sink them in how they're led to give, all right? Sink, 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 sink in Jesus' name. So when I approach this text, I'm not, you know, trying to put the spotlight on you and I'm going to start inspecting through the Word of God your level of giving. That's not my point at all. However, because it's in this book, I have a license to preach it. 
And I thank God that I, I pastor a church that says, if it's in this book, you better be preaching it, Lynn. Yeah. Otherwise, we can find somebody else that will preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because we do have churches and pastors today that they only preach certain parts of the Bible. And so we're not getting the whole counsel of God's Word. So quickly, let me just read this text. It says, bring the full tithe, the tenth, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test. This is one of these phenomenal statements by God. God says, you can, you can see whether I'm a liar or not. You can put me to a test. We're told in other places, don't tempt God. But here's one of the exceptions where God says, tempt, test me. Prove me that I'm not a liar in this. And so he says, and, and I'm not threatened by you testing me in this. But he says, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down you the blessing until there is no more need. Or other translation says there's no more places to contain the blessing. So we see that giving unlocks, sowing unlocks reaping. But there is something between the sowing and the reaping. And there is this statement that I think that we again just somehow read past it, but God said, what will connect to an overflowing harvest based upon you sowing is this thing of the windows of heaven being open to the people of God. And so we think that it's just nice little language, you know, like God's up there going, I have a window in heaven, I'll open it. And so it's just figurative language, you know, it's like God opening things up and going, boo-hoo, people of God, I want to bless you. But as you drill down in this text, I want to go, God, shouldn't it be the, the door of heaven is open? Why the window? Why windows of heaven? What, does, what do windows represent spiritually, figuratively, symbolically in this passage? Because I've been around uh, granaries in which grain was transferred from one storehouse to another or from one granary into trucks for transportation, and I never have ever witnessed any of those workers opening up a window for the, the, the result of the harvest being poured out into a container. They never opened up a window. It was always a door. It was a lever that was raised that opened up a gate or a door and transferred the harvest into other containers. But here's a link. I think this could revolutionize our giving. I think it could revolutionize our lives if we can start cooperating with heaven and allowing heaven to come into earth. How many of you want more of that? Where I want what's there to come into my time, where I want eternal realities to break into my time, and that things around me are changed by kingdom impact and abundance. So here's the link. God says... If you bring the tithe in the storehouse, I want you to know the result is that there is going to be no room for you to contain it. There will be no need. But how you get there is God says, I am going to have to open the windows of heaven for you. What does that mean? The windows of heaven are things that we can see through. Right? Right? So if we had windows in this sanctuary, which we do not, which helps the daydreamers, because <laughs> you can't be looking out and going, look, squirrel. <laughs> or how bad is the snow getting? See, you don't know any of that. We could have five inches on the ground before this message is over, and, and you're just in ignorant bliss right now. You won't have to deal with what's up. But if we did have a window, we could, we could have people peer in, and they could see everything on the inside, right? Most of us live our spiritual life, and I'm trying to condense this to, to let you go, but I've got to finish here. Most of us are saying, God, I, I'm living my old life with its limits, and I want heaven just to take my old life and improve it and make it somewhat better. But God gives windows 
in heaven so that those of us that are leaving the old and saying, no, I don't want to live an old life with limitations and ask for just a little bit to make my bad life better. I want it to pass away. I want to step into new creation realities and for me to receive from heaven so that I can be sourced from heaven, I need to see what's in heaven. So right now, Jesus is, is expressing his life around the throne of God. I, I think every day we need to say, Holy Spirit, help me see what Jesus' life is like right now in this moment. Because if we did go to Colossians, Colossians says that your life is now hid in Christ, in God. So whatever is Christ's experience now, whatever he's experiencing, whatever is his life experience, whatever is the abundance of that life, the Lord says, I want you to be so fused and hid and, 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 and fused and married and in union with him that whatever his life is right now, that becomes your life now as well. So this is the way, as much as I know now, it can work. The Lord wants me to see, by revelation, what life in heaven is like. Because I cannot have an expectation or a faith or even embrace an empowerment of love for me to function any differently on this plane of reality unless I see what life is like over there. So my wife and I, we went through this process of selling a house, buying a house, and at first, it's real fun. <laughs> After the 20th one, it's like, you go, honey, I don't want to look at anything anymore. But you start seeing how the Joneses live. Look at what they did with that there. Look at how they remodeled their bathroom. And all of a sudden, there's this inspiration that comes to you by seeing how other people are living and what they've done in their domain. Then there are some other times where you go, I don't think that turned out the way they wanted it to turn out. <laughs> there are those moments, but it does. It enlarges your vision and gives you ideas. So if you don't sell your house, at least you can improve your house if you're staying there because now you've seen how everybody else is living. Until the people of God get a glimpse of how Jesus is living in heaven, you will not know how to live here on the earth. Okay, now I want to finish with this analogy. Windows represent revelatory experiences where we're able to see the unseen and the visible, invisible becomes visible to us because the Lord is opening our eyes and we're catching glimpses of what the life of Jesus is like. And then you notice that these windows are not just for peering through, but God opens them and from that clarity comes blessing that he releases. You see what I have for you? Guess what? I'm not going to say, the window's locked, come back tomorrow. No, he says, you see this? I saw you pressing your nose up against the window. You want some of this, don't you? I'm going to have to get the vinegar out, the vinegar water, and I'm going to have to clean up because not only was your nose up there, your mouth was up there. I got your lip prints on this revelation window, and you were wanting in. Well, I'm going to say, you don't have to just be an outsider looking in. I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to pour it out on you because you're responding to me in faith. So I told this story but I, I, I really cannot give you an illustration that's better than this one that shows you how God can give us moments of revelation and how obedience to what God is saying connects sowing to dimensions of biblical harvest. 
seven years ago, it's been already, I was in Nigeria and I was preaching at a conference. And there was a pastor there from London that shared about how he had a young man in his church, college graduate, and he wanted to become a businessman because God had spoken to him that he was going to be like a Joseph and a Daniel, that he was going to be a minister of finances in the kingdom. He saw something. The problem was, that's what he saw, but he wasn't there yet. And in England, I guess every year, they have a a time where they um, open up for bids and transport contracts are open for vendors to, to bid for these contracts. Worth millions and millions of dollars. And so what he did was he laid out a business plan, printed cards, had everything on paper, the dream, the vision, what he wanted to do, but he could not get lines of credit to open up and and have the infrastructure, the leasing of the trucks, the office space, the warehouse, everything else. And so it came down to the deadline and he just, he was denied by a number of bankers. Therefore, he could not submit his business plan and his bid for one of these contracts. So in desperation, he goes to see his pastor. So I want to pause right there. How desperate are you to see the kingdom come in your life? Are you ready to, if what you're doing is not working out for you, how many are ready to say, I need to start doing something different? Well, this young man just grew desperate. And so what he did was he went to see his pastor. He said, Pastor, today is the day. And I'm not going to go into the explanation. You already heard it. But he said, please pray for me. I, I need this breakthrough to come. And he goes, I felt like God was positioning me for breakthrough. And I had clarity on how he did, but I've been denied the finances to do it. And the pastor told the whole conference, he said, you know when that young man came in and his his desperation of faith, when he came in to me, he goes, "I, I didn't have a faith to even believe that anything could change. He said, I did one of these pastoral prayers God, just help this young man, you know, bless the mess, help him in his struggle. Lord, if you could do something for him, do something for him. He said, I really was not engaged because, I mean, he needed a line of credit worth thousands of dollars and he didn't qualify for it. So it was beyond what was possible. And because I wasn't seeing in the kingdom of what was possible with God, For all things are possible with God. There's nothing possible with man, but all things are possible with God. And so he said, I just kind of laid empty hands on him with no faith. And I just, God help him. And he said, this young man got ready to walk to the door. And and he just said, pray, continue to pray for me. And he said, he whirled around and he ran back to me. And he reached in his pocket and he said, I took this out of the bank. This is all the money we have. I have 1,500 pounds because they were in England. And he said, this is all I have. He goes, don't tell my wife I'm doing this. And he said, I'm just going to sow this in a radical way into the kingdom. And this guy said, I struggled to take it. I said, no, 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 no. He goes, you're going to get me in trouble with your wife. I'm not going to take it. He said, I took that money. And he said, I set it aside to where after the emotion settled down and he, his wife called me. I could return his offering back to his wife. But he said this young man drives to the center of town and there was a city square with businesses around it, but a park in the middle. And he said that he pulled up in there. And again, he's saying, God, I don't want to face my wife. The deadline is looming. I'm running out of time. God, show me what to do. He said, just like that windows of heaven open. And he said that the Lord spoke to him with great clarity and said, get out of your car, walk over there, go into that bookstore. And he wrestled with it, because we do, because it doesn't make sense. How's this going to lead to me become a minister of finance in the kingdom of God? He walks across the street, goes into the bookstore, He says, I have no money. I just gave my pastor this offering. And he goes, I have no money. So I'm just flipping through the magazines, looking at the headlines in the newspaper. He said, I looked down the aisle, and there's a guy 
that I graduated college with hadn't seen him in several years. He said, we turn and look at each other and we have recognition. Like, hey, bud, I remember you. So they walk over there. They, they start making a reacquaintance. And the guy asks him a question. He says, so what are you doing? What are you doing now? And he said, uh, he just dumped the story. He goes, well, today is the day, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, here's my business card. I had this dream of a truck transport business, but I can't get financing, so I'm back to the drawing board. He said when the guy looked at his card, you could tell there was this just astonishment. The guy steps back. And he goes, I mean, you got more than a card? Do you have a business plan? He goes, yeah, I got my business plan out of the card. He said, let me tell you who I am. He said, I am the one that awards the government contracts <laughs> for transport. Oh, it gets better. He said, I was in the office, and he goes, during this time of the year, as it comes down to crunch, he said, I've got politicians that are wanting their nephew to get these contracts, nepotism. He said, there's corruption. People are offering me bribes. He said, I'm a Christian, though. And he said, I told my staff around me, he said, I got to get out of here. He said, because I always try to make these decisions based upon me connecting in the kingdom and, and these are God's resources, and I want them to be allocated for kingdom advancement. And he said, I ran out of my office, and I came down here, and I was saying, God, show me who to give some contracts to. He tells this guy, <laughs> he tells this guy, he says, I want, here, here, I'm going to write on the back of your card the name of this banker. He said, you tell him that I'm sending you to him and that he's to give you this much line of credit and tell him that I'm going to give you, if I look at your business plan and I see that it's in order, I'm gonna give you this contract and it's worth this many millions of dollars. He'll give you several thousand for the millions of this contract. This young man, to make the long story longer, this young man a week later runs into his church during service, interrupts the meeting, and the pastor was saying, this young man runs in and he goes, Pastor, I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. And he's going, what are you talking about? And he goes, Pastor, I didn't have time to call you. I didn't have time to text you. He goes, I had to lease trucks. I had to lease office space. I had to get warehouses. I had to hire drivers. I had to do all this. But he said, I got the government contract that I was wanting to get. You guys say, that can't happen. Well, when I was hearing it, I was saying, that sounds too good to be true. That sounds like a dream come true. That sounds like something that only God can do. But if I have no expectation and I don't see the linkage between my, my giving and my serving and my living for God and then this this proportional kingdom harvest that he wants to bring in our life. And I don't see that God has the capability of letting me see into heaven itself and to hear from heaven itself. Then I'll go ahead and continue to live my life in the small measures that I do, trusting God to make my life just a little bit better. And then trying to convince unbelievers around me that my life is better than theirs. But the Lord says, arise and shine for your light has come. Your light, your illumination, your revelatory experiences from heaven, your light. I'm not going to leave you in the dark. My sons and daughters, I'm not going to leave you in the dark to where you don't know what heaven is up to and what heaven is doing. No, I'm going to let the light shine upon you, and you're going to arise and reflect that shining bright light upon you. Then he said, then the nations are going to change their tune because they're going to be attracted to the light of your rising. I want you to stand with me.